Well, hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from today. Welcome to Engineering for Change, or E4C for short. Today, we're very pleased to bring you a special segment in E4C's 2016 webinar series, focusing on mobile data collection. My name is Yana Aranda, and I'm the Director of Engineering for Change Programs, and I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. I'd like to take a moment now to tell you a bit about the mobile data collection series. The widespread availability of mobile communication offers international development researchers, practitioners, and students new tools and techniques for collecting field data and determining the success of projects. So we've partnered with the Development Impact Lab at UC Berkeley for a series of six webinars to introduce a sample of the survey software tools and demonstrate how to implement each tool in practice. For a recorded introduction to the series, we invite you to visit the E4C homepage. Today's webinar is the third in the series, featuring Survey CTO, introduced by Faizan Dewan of Dubility Inc. Our next webinar will be with Voto Mobile on March 16th at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you would like to make a recommendation for a specific platform, future topics and speakers, we invite you to contact the series team via the email addresses visible on the slide. Now, before we move on to our presenters, I'd like to tell you a bit more about E4C and who we are. E4C is a knowledge exchange platform and global community of over 1 million engineers, designers, development practitioners, and social scientists leveraging technology to solve quality of life challenges faced by underserved communities, including access to clean water, sanitation, sustainable energy, improved agriculture, and more. We invite you to join E4C by becoming a member. E4C membership provides cost-free access to relevant and current news, professional development resources, including jobs and fellowships, and a growing database of hundreds of poverty alleviating products in our solutions library. E4C members enjoy a unique user experience based on their site behavior and engagement. Essentially, the more you interact with our site, the better we'll be able to serve you resources that meet your needs and interests. We invite you to join our passionate global community and continue to making people's lives better across the world. Please check out our website, engineeringforchange.org, to learn more and sign up. We're excited to collaborate with Dill on this and future webinars. Dill is an international consortium of universities, research institutes, NGOs, and industry partners addressing global poverty through advances in science and engineering. Dill is headquartered at the University of California, Berkeley, and was launched in 2012 with the support of the U.S. Agency for International Development through the U.S. Global Development Lab. This leverages the innovative capacity of world-class universities to design development solutions which couple new technologies with novel economic and behavioral interventions. Dill calls this approach development engineering. The webinar you're participating in today is part of E4C's professional development offerings. The E4C webinar series is a free, publicly available series of online seminars showcasing the best practices and thinking of development practitioners, information on upcoming installments in the series, as well as archived videos of past presentations can be found on the E4C webinars page. If you're following us on Twitter today, I'd also like to invite you to join the conversation with our dedicated hashtag, hashtag E4C webinars. Now, a few housekeeping items before we get started. Let's see where everyone is from today. In the chat window, which is located at the bottom right of your screen, please type your location. If the chat is not open on your screen, you can access it by clicking the chat icon in the top right corner of the screen. Thank you, everyone, for entering your locations, and we welcome you all from all around the world and all around the states. Any technical questions or administrative problems should go in the chat window. During the webinar, please use the Q&A window, which is located right below the chat, to type in your questions to the presenter. Again, if you don't see this, you can access it by clicking the Q&A icon in the top right corner. If you're listening to the audio broadcast and you encounter any troubles, please try hitting stop and then start. You may also want to try opening up WebEx in a different browser. Following the webinar, to request a certificate of completion showing one professional development hour for the session, please follow the instructions at the top of the E4C professional development page. 
All right, and it's now my pleasure to introduce to you our, our speaker for the day. We have with us five on day one of Jubilee Inc. I'm not going to read the bio this morning, but I will just hand it over to Faison to take that you and introduce us to Sir ACTO. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, no, uh, thank you guys for um, for hosting the webinar, um, and thank you everybody for for taking the time out of your day to to listen to me talk a little bit about uh, Survey CTO. So I have to briefly introduce myself. I'm Fazan. I work at Survey CTO, and which is a mobile data collection tool designed for resource constrained settings. So if you're collecting, doing surveys, uh, monitoring and evaluation, etc., in field settings where you don't have an internet connection, but you want to collect data using smartphones or tablets, you could do that using Survey CTO. Um, before joining Survey CTO, I actually spent many years myself uh, in the research world. So I was working for Innovations of Poverty Action, uh, which is a partner of the Poverty Action Lab at MIT, uh, as a research manager in Kenya, where I, I ran a few different uh, impact evaluation studies. Um, in particular, for example, I uh, did a lot of research on unconditional cash transfers in partnership with an organization called Give Directly. Um, and also did a few different studies, uh, such as on uh, the impact of vocational skills training for, for women who own small and medium enterprises um, and uh, impact of, of extension training for, for farmers to improve farm yields. Um, I also worked and managed the Busara Behavioral Economics Lab, at, uh, which is in, in Nairobi. Uh, and yeah, and you know, in the process while I was doing all this work, um, at the time when I was working at IPA, we were doing transitioning from paper surveys to using digital data collection um, for because of all its advantages. Um, and so I sort of was at an exciting phase in, in the organization where we got to actually help projects transfer from paper to digital data collection. Um, and in the process, I myself you know, used a lot of different, tried a lot of different tools um, for my own research, uh, learned a lot of you know, uh, lessons in the process. And uh, at the end, I decided to join Survey CTO because I was so impressed with what the company was doing um, and thought that in the digital data collection space, they were doing a lot of interesting things and wanted to sort of bring my own experience to help inform that. Um, so before I actually dive into talking more about Survey CTO, I actually wanted to first get to know the attendees a little better. Um, so if you can, in the chat window, so that everybody can see, type out sort of your responses to a few of these prompts. For example, how many people here have conducted any surveys before even using paper? Um, and how many of you have worked with other mobile data collection tools or even Service CTO before? Um, and what are sort of the challenges that you faced uh, collecting data in the field. Um, yeah, and you know, I can tell you a little bit about my own work. Like I said, I've done sort of surveys both on paper and using a variety of data collection tools, um, including uh, a Windows tool called Blaze, um, Open Data Kit, which is what Service CTO is based on, and Service CTO itself. Uh, and I mean, the challenges are, are many, ranging from, you know, sort of trying to figure out, making sure that the data that I'm collecting, that my surveyors who are out in the field, who are, you know, in remote places, um, can get me the data easily, who are, can collect the data easily. And, you know, for example, I can, you know, I can monitor their work, audit their work, um, things like that. Uh, all right, so I see Enrique says he's, he's mainly used paper. Oh, Chris, and Chris, Chris says he's used paper. Um, oh, okay, Kristen, thank you, Kristen, for, for the shout out, appreciate it. Um, yeah, other other challenges that people have faced. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, cool. Um, so there's a few different thoughts that people had, um, and I'll keep an eye on these as they keep coming in. But to quickly summarize what we have so far. Um, and then I'll sort of dive into service each year and how it could potentially address some of the challenges you guys have. Uh, so I think a lot of people mentioned the issues around quality, so making sure that the data you're collecting is high quality, being able to catch errors, things like that. Um, um, and, you know, a lot of people mentioned that they need to be able to use something that will work offline, so in a setting without any internet connectivity, um, and also being able to transfer data easily once it's collected to where you can analyze it. Um, and yeah, so I'll address some of these topics as we go through the presentation. I'll come back to uh, some of these specific challenges people have faced in the Q&A. Um, yeah, so thank you so much. And yeah, you can keep sort of uh, chatting in the window if you have more 
ideas or points you want me to touch on. So first, sort of to give you a little bit of background about Service ETO and, and why Service ETO was started. So Service ETO was actually founded by Christopher Robert, who's uh, a research fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government um, and also does a lot of his own economics research in partnership with JPAL in South India. And he first started Service CTO when, you know, in his own research in 2011, he needed a tool uh, for collecting digital data offline that was both affordable and could be used easily by his team. So you know, he was facing a lot of the same challenges that people here are facing, which is around issues of data quality, around issues of being able to work offline. Um, and, you know, he didn't want to reinvent the wheel, start building something from scratch. Um, there were a few different tools available at the time. And he thought the most promising one was an open source tool called Open Data Kit. Uh, and actually, there's an, the ODK team will also be presenting as part of this webinar series in, in a few weeks. Uh, open Data Kit was a great starting point. Uh, you know, it's a, it, we have a great relationship with the team. Um, they're doing a lot of amazing work. Um, but it is, as an open source tool, it can be a little bit rough around the edges. It's not supported. Um, and so it does require a lot of technical capacity on the users and to, to be able to use it, install it, maintain it. And what Chris wanted was uh, something that had all the strengths of ODK, um, but at the same time could be used as had, you know, professional support team behind it so that if you needed help, you could get it in a timely way. Um, that was a more polished product for more professional or professional use. So, you know, for example, there were some reliability issues uh, that he wanted to fix and something that was sort of off the shelf. So it was as easy to use as Gmail. You sign up and you're good to go. Um, and sort of that's how Service CTO was born. He took Open Data Kit and added a lot of these improvements focused on reliability, uh, flexibility, and, and support. Um, and sort of, you know, in the space of all this, all the, so yeah, so, so that's how she started Service CTO. Um, and, you know, for those of you who are familiar with the digital data collection, you'll know that there's a whole bunch of these tools out there. Uh, we're not the only one. I think Koba presented last week or two weeks ago, ODK is presenting. There's a few other surveying tools out there. Um, and so I wanted to sort of explain where we fit sort of in this space of digital data collection tools. So given our background, we sort of view ourselves as a, sort of the perfect fit between, you know, the open source tools and sort of slightly more expensive paid tools. Uh, the idea being that we get the strength of both, you know, open source flexibility and power and the professional, professional you know, reliability and, and stability and support of, of paid tools. Um, and when we're you know, building our service ETO, we focus sort of on a few key areas that we, you know, what that the software should and the company should represent. One is we wanted a tool that's powerful. So, you know, whether you're the World Bank and IPA or you're a smaller NGO doing, you know, you know, daily M&E, you should have a tool that can sort of address all your needs, that can handle short surveys and long surveys, that can handle, um, you know, all sorts of complex survey design requirements. Um, but at the same time, it should be usable and manageable. So it should be, uh, you know, easy to use. It shouldn't require you to be a technical expert or, or you know, require a lot of coding for you to be able to use it or a lot of training. Um, we also wanted to make sure that it was a tool that, was well supported, so we have a team, a great team of of uh, of staff who themselves have lots of experience in the field and in research, um, and so you know they understand the user's context, are always very responsive. Uh, so yeah, so we wanted to build something that had a great team behind it, so that we can help all our users get the most out of the platform. Um, and at the same time, uh, we wanted a tool that was still extremely reliable, um, secure, and affordable. Uh, you know, it's one thing to have lots of fancy features, it's another to make sure that they actually work in the field in an offline setting when you really need them to. Um, so yeah, so we focus a lot on making a tool that's very stable. Um, we pay a lot of attention to details and do a lot of rigorous testing before we roll it out to our users. Um, and actually sort of dive a little bit more into, into that. Um, you, know, you know, like I've already mentioned, we have an app that is powerful. So, you know, we wanted something that was very flexible. You can do pretty much anything you need to do for your survey. Um, we, another area we focused on is quality. So, uh, for example, we've added lots of features to allow you to monitor your surveyors and check the quality of the data that's coming in. Uh, so, for example, people mentioned that they, you know, they're always worried about the quality of their data. And while moving from digit, paper to digital addresses some of those issues, uh, we felt that we also wanted to take the potential of a digital tool and take it to the next level. So, if, for example, we've added features like audio and text audits which lets you, you know, invisibly listen in to different parts of the survey 
Uh, so, you know, without the surveyor knowing. So basically your microphone, the microphone on the device will turn on and visibly record a clip. Uh, and then when you get your data later on, you can listen in on this clip later. Um, and the surveyor has no idea. So you can see sort of what they were up to. Uh, we also added what we call frequency checks um, on the server, which allow you to basically, you know, set up checks on your incoming data to check for patterns like interviewer effects, uh, you can see, obviously, metadata and look at differences in the metadata between one surveyor and the team. So, for example, you could see if one surveyor's surveys are much shorter on average than the team as a whole, which would tell you that something suspicious is going on. Uh, so we've added all these features that allow you to monitor your data for quality and catch errors very quickly and detect fraud. Um, and another area, obviously, that matters to us is performance. So we have users who are using us for small scale, scale surveys, all the way to users who are using us for very large scale surveys. For example, you know, uh, they use Service CTU for for the for for the 2015 Mexico national elections, where they had one day to poll, you know, do polling around the entire country, and they had tens of thousands of submissions coming in. And so we wanted to make sure that the platform we build is able to is stable and able to handle all sorts of loads and needs of users. Um, and I think this is also where we dif differentiate ourselves from a lot of the other tools. Uh, you know, I think it's uh, it's easy to have a cloud server. It's not easy to have a cloud server that um, that is very stable, that has 100% uptime, and that can handle a lot of a lot of loads. So, if you're an organization that's doing very large scale surveys, I think you'll see there's a noticeable difference in in performance between Service CTO and some of the other tools. Um, so, yeah, it's an app that's powerful but still usable. Um, so, those of you who've used um, ODK before you'll know that you know the standard way to program in ODK and ODK-based tools or create a survey is using an Excel spreadsheet. And you can still do that in Service CTO. We have power users who uh, find the flexibility um, of the Excel format uh, very, very, uh, very appealing. But we wanted something that was more accessible uh, for users as well. So we actually built out a drag and drop form builder, um, which I'll show you in a little bit as part of our demo, which makes it much easier for a beginner user to start creating and, and using, doing surveys in Service CTO. Um, similarly, you know, I talked about the high frequency checks earlier. Um, so people from organizations such as IPA or the World Bank will, you know, will already be familiar with how to do high frequency checks. And, you know, you could always have created them and coded them in, in something like Stata, um, but that required a lot of statistical knowledge. It required advanced knowledge of, of coding and tools like that. Um, and so it wasn't really very accessible to users. And so, again, similarly, we actually built a drag and drop version on our server, which very quickly and easily lets anybody set up a quality check of the same kind without having to have all that technical know-how or hiring somebody who does have that technical know-how. Um, similarly, also on the analysis side, you know, we've integrated with a service called StatWing, which automatically visualizes your data for you. So again, something that previously would take a lot of time and effort and, and technical knowledge to code up in Stata or SPSS or SAS, you can now easily do in a single click or two with with survey CTO. And again, I, I'll demonstrate this for you in our demo. Um, and, you know, so an app that's powerful, but still usable and built on solid foundations. So I already, you know, touched on this a little bit, and I want to sort of reiterate, you know, it's one thing to have a tool to focus on features, and features are obviously important, um, but something that also matters in software is making sure that the software actually works. So, you know, there's very little point in having you know, X, Y, Z features if they don't actually work when you need them to. And so at Service CTO, we focused a lot on making sure that the core foundations of the platform are, are solid, that it's a very reliable platform that works. We fixed, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of bugs that we found in other tools. Um, we rigorously test everything before we roll it out to users. Uh, we let users choose when to update to a new version so that if they're comfortable with the current version they're using, they're not forced to change partway through data collection. Um, similarly, we also then make sure to back that up with an excellent support team, uh, which isn't just, you know, again, like I said, isn't just sort of customer support stuff, but actually researchers from the field who understand the user's context, uh, who spend a lot of time in care, sort of listening to our users, understanding what their issues are and what their needs are and, and responding in a thoughtful way. So we sort of view ourselves almost as, as partners and colleagues of everybody who uses us and, and work very closely with our users to make sure that their project runs very smoothly. Um, and finally, another very important foundation that we think isn't talked about enough is also security. Um, I think most of our users are collecting very sensitive 
identifying information. And so we also wanted to make a platform that, again, went beyond the sort of the, the most basic level of security um, uh, to, to something that, you know, truly met the needs of the IRBs that, you know, made sure that the respondents' data was actually protected. So, you know, for example, we make sure that not only is all our data encrypted in transit when you're sending it from the device to a server, um, but that, you know, you can actually encrypt your data at rest even using what we call public-private key pairs. So only you as a user have will have the decryption key, which will decrypt the data when you download it onto your computer. So even we as a service CTO could never view or understand, or you know, view that data on our servers. Um, similarly, we spend a lot of resources on making sure that our servers have, you know, state-of-the-art firewalls that they're monitored 24/7, uh, uh, you know, for any attempts at, at breaches. Um, we lease all our, our servers from Amazon Web Services, which has security guards and CCTV footage monitoring of, of all their data centers. Um, and we've also added a whole bunch of features that easily let users separate automatically, per, you know, personal identifying information from other data, so that if you do have to share data, you're sharing it in a secure way without compromising anybody's privacy. Um, and, you know, I think these issues aren't talked about enough, um, but do matter a lot when you're trying to decide what your organization should be using to do all, to do all of their research. Um, all right, so you know, there's having said all that, there's obviously a lot more um, that I could talk about with Service CTO. But you know, given the time constraints of this webinar, I'm going to actually you know now dive into a live demo which sort of shows you the workflow and how you would work from in Service CTO from start to finish. Um, but if you wanted, you know, we have a few of these extra, you know, a lot of other features. Um, that people might find interesting, and I'm happy to address them during the Q&A. So, for example, we've advanced features for streaming data from one form to another. Um, we have, you know, case management, which lets you push assignments to individual surveyors. Um, you can, you know, we have support for streaming data automatically to external systems like Google Sheets or Fusion Tables or any sort of information manage management system you have um, using our APIs. Um, so, yeah, so I'm not going to get into all of these right now, but if you have any interest in a specific feature and you want to learn more about it, we can talk about it in the Q&A. Um, now, having said all of that, so yeah, how does Service CTO actually work? Uh, the workflow or the process is, is sort of very simple five-step process, right? You design your form in Service CTO, you deploy it, and you can then collect your data offline in our Android app on smartphones or tablets, or you can collect it even online uh, using our web forms. Um, and then you Will, and as data is collected, it can then automatically it's, it can be submitted to the server. If your servers are collecting data offline, the servers service gets saved in the app until they are able to connect online. Um, and then data, as soon as it comes in, is aggregated and can be analyzed or exported instantly. So I'm now going to switch to sharing my screen um, so that you guys can actually see uh, the demo. All right. So let me turn on screen share. All right. Yeah, all right. So I think everybody can can see my desktop now. So you'll see this is the uh, Service CTO server console. I'm already logged in. Um, so the way it works is when you create a Service CTO account, everybody gets their own URL. So you'll see I'm using a URL called use.servicecto.com, which is a server I use for demos. But you'll have your own uh, URL and your own server console, which you would log into by going to that URL. When you log in, uh, this is what the, your server console looks like. You can see the workflow or the layout is designed according to the workflow of a project, which is design, collect, monitor, and export. Um, so the first step when you use Service CTO is to design a form, and you can do that by clicking the Start New Form button uh, under the Design section. You can give it a title. So let's say I was creating a form called Sample Form 2. Um, and you can even actually use a library of forms you already have to get started. So, for example, you could say, all right, I'm going to click the, the basic sample form and start with that. You click Next. Um, and then you'll click the Edit Online button, which will launch our form builder in a new tab. I already did that a little bit earlier so that we don't waste too much time on the call. Um, so, yeah, so you can see when you open that form, uh, this is what it looks like. Um, and then you can easily sort of edit the form by adding questions. Uh, so you can add all sorts of question types, like visible fields. You can add calculations, which are hidden fields. For example, if you want to calculate the sum of some some integer values that you're that you're collecting, um, so you can sort of modify the form very easily using our drag and drop form builder. Uh, whenever you're done and ready to start collecting data, you can just hit save and deploy. Um, and as soon as you do that, the form appears 
under your your form section. Um, so you can see, for example, we have a sample form here which I had created earlier for the demo. Uh, and then once the form is here, you can collect it, start collecting data in two ways. You could deploy it as a web form uh, by switching to the collect tab and you know either clicking fill out or sharing the web form link. Um, and if you did that, it would open a web form, for example, in a browser tab like this. This is what our web forms look like. Um, so you can see I'm going to swipe forward. I'm going to say, yep, I want to continue. All right, let's, uh, let's fill in this survey. All right, all right, let's fill in this. Um, all right, and I'm going to quickly submit. So that was just a quick, short survey. Um, and now the form has been submitted, and it actually shows up on the server. Uh, an alternative way to, do, to collect this data, if, especially if you're collecting it offline, is to use our Android app. So uh, I have a simulation of an Android phone up on my screen. All right, so this is what our Android app looks like. Um, you can see it's a very simple screen, again, designed to be super easy to use, especially for surveyors. Uh, so you open the Android app, you click Get Blank Form, um, and you'll see that the form that we had created on our server is available for download. I click Get Selected, um, and once I do that, the form is now available on the device, even offline. Uh, and then I can fill in as many surveys as I need completely offline by clicking Fill Blank Form and then selecting the form that I want to fill in. All right, so I'm going to also fill this form in just so that you guys can see um, how the Android app works. All right. All right, and again, you can save form and exit. Um, and then once it's saved, it shows up under Send Finalized Form from where we can upload it whenever we do get an internet connection. All right. Um, all right, and so then once we do that, the data is now actually, we can switch over to our monitor tab. We should be able to see our submissions uh, come in. All right, let's look at form submissions. All right. Let's refresh this. There we go. We can see there's two submissions that I just submitted, one from the web form and one via the Android app. Um, and then you can export your data or analyze it by going to the export tab. So here we have our sample form. I could download the data as a CSV file by clicking download, or I can click the analyze button and open the data in our visualization window. Um, so this form doesn't have too much data, so I actually created some sample data to show you guys what it looks like when you want to analyze the data. Um, so I would click the Analyze button, and then I would open, it would open an analysis in a new tab, which I already had opened for you earlier. Um, so you can see this is what the visualization space looks like. Uh, all the variables in our data set are on the left, um, and we can select a variable and choose to describe it, uh, which sort of creates a chart or table automatically in the right-hand side. Um, and you can also look at relations in variables for analysis purposes. So let's say, I wanted to look at interviewer effects, and I wanted to see and by surveyor if uh, my answer to certain questions varied. So let's look at uh, vegetable consumed in kilos on average and see if there's a, an interviewer effect. So I can click those two and I click relate, um, and you can see that it'll tell me, it'll run a statistical check and tell me, okay, there's a strong statistically significant relationship between surveyor ID and vegetables consumed in kilos. And what this actually very quickly tells me is so there's a problem with my data because based on who's doing the survey, the answers for this variable vary significantly, which means the survey is actually having an effect on the answers being collected. Um, and you can see there's a huge difference, for example, for survey 16, the average is five and a half kilos, whereas for you know, survey 18, it's only three kilos. Um, and, and that's it. That's sort of the whole process for survey CTO from, from start to finish, from launching your survey to collecting data and then analyzing it. Um, so I'm going to now turn off the screen share. Um, yeah, and so I think that sort of brings me to the end of my demo and my very quick run through of Service ETO. And I wanted to leave a lot of time for Q&A. So, so yeah, based on what people saw, um, if you have questions, comments, uh, if you want to learn a bit more about some of the other features that I couldn't touch on given the time constraints, uh, yeah, please sort of type them out actually in the chat window so that everybody can see. All right. Oh, um, actually, thank you, Faisan, first and foremost. Really appreciate that was probably one of the fastest demos we've ever experienced. Um, but uh, I also wanted to uh, hear there's some questions in the Q&A window. So uh, one question that came in is regarding um, the analysis. Do the analysis features work on encrypted data? 
So very good question. Um, so yes, and no. so the way we set up encryption is you can choose to encrypt your entire survey, but then still mark individual fields as publishable. So what that will allow you to do is you can encrypt your form so that your identifying information is encrypted, but any non-identifying data or fields are still visible to the server. And then you'd still be able to specifically analyze those fields in the visualization window without having the identifying information unencrypted. Okay. And uh, we have another, a couple of questions related to our last webinar um, in this series. So we had featured um, Kobo Toolbox. I'm not mm -hmm. sure if you're familiar. Mm -hmm. So uh, the question here, a little, a little a challenge here, is despite the fact that Kobo is intended mainly for humanitarian organizations, mm -hmm. uh, what is the, your difference or value add in comparison to Kobo? Sure. Um, very good question. So I think. I mean, it's always, like I say, you know, I always like to say talk is cheap, and the best way to know the difference is to try out service CTO and try it Kobo and sort of for users to make their own decision. Um, and obviously, I'm biased. So, uh, but I think that, like, I think that the big difference is in the three key areas, uh, which I mentioned, which is one is reliability, uh, as, and the other is support, and then security. So, um, you know, yes, we do have a drag and drop form builder. Kobo does too. In fact, Kobo, I think, sort of really they, they did it first, I fully admit, and they were an inspiration for it. Um, but if you've used the Kobo drag and drop form builder, you'll see it's not as uh, powerful. So, for example, there's a lot of things that aren't supported in the drag and drop form builder that you could do in Excel, for example. And what we wanted was a more complete form builder so that even if you wanted to do, you know, create all sorts of question types that you were used to, that you would otherwise need to program directly, you could still do that in the form builder. Um, that's mm -hmm. one, you know, big area. The other big difference is just support. So we have, a, like I said, you know, very professional support team um, that, you know, is always ready to respond to all our users. Um, and sort of, I think, so it depends, you know, on the user, whether they're comfortable and depending on the time and capacity they have, uh, they might feel like, you know what, we'll support ourselves if we have an issue, you know, we have X hours in our day to sort of spend figuring it out. Um, but if you're sort of more, if you have a more streamlined operation, you have more of a time crunch, and you just, or you just need sort of, you just want somebody who's always there for you who sort of got your back, then I think it's worth using Service ETO because of that, of that support that we provide. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And then the other, the final issue is security. So, you know, I think like I mentioned, a, it's not always visible on the front end, but a lot of the work and import, like a lot of the differences between software happen on the back end. So, you know, what is your server infrastructure like? How much, how many resources are being spent to, to make sure that different user servers are, are, are siloed and protected from other users? What resources are being spent to make sure that, um, you know, the firewalls and, you know, there's excellent firewalls that everything is being monitored 24 um, seven, that, you know, the servers have uptime, that the servers, have a lot of memory and capacity to, to handle lots of surveys. Um, and that's, I think, a big area where we expend a lot of resources um, mm -hmm. compared to Google and other tools. Um, yeah. So I think those are the and three on, things. Uh -huh. And on, on the note of support, did you offer support in Spanish? Uh, so we're not exactly. So we do have lots of users uh, who use that, who are, you know, primary Spanish speakers, and we've done our best to support them. We basically tend to use uh, Google Translate for a lot of our support in that in that oh. case. And um, But yeah, we don't have sort of a, a fluent Spanish speaker on staff yet. It's definitely something we want to expand into. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm happy to also put Enrique in touch with some of our, our users in Latin America, and, and you know, he can talk to them as well to learn about their experience. Um, yeah. Right. So I'm going to come back to a couple of uh, the, this is a multi-part question, but I just want to make sure that we, we spread out, spread the love here a little bit. Mm -hmm. So um, I think there's some questions relative to uh, the actual mechanics of, of Survey CTO. So is it possible to show about a little bit more about the relevance and constraints in the form builder? Mm -hmm. Oh, sure. Yeah, and of also course. Review, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip a couple of these and also review how skip pattern works. Of course. Uh, so, right. So, let me just do that. So, I'm going to switch over to my screen okay. share again. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, I think you need to make me a presenter for me to do that. So, uh, I think that, let me see if I can do that. I think, actually, uh, the, our administrators have to give you, there we go. You're, you're all set to go. go. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, I think I'm. All right. So, so I'm going to switch over to our form designer. So, yeah. So, let's, let's sort of walk through that. So, let's say I want to create, let's create a question. I'm going to create a question. Uh, inside my consent repeat, oops, consent group, so it's only asked of people who are given consent. So let's say I'm creating a integer question. Uh, you know, what is your weekly income, right? So you 
type the question text, you select the question type, and you hit configure, um, and that opens a pop-up window where you can configure your skip patterns and constraints. So the first section is very simple, and then you can add, you click more options, and it sort of opens up the relevance and constraint builder. So if I wanted to build a relevance, I would click add relevance. Um, I can specify it by hand, or I can, actually, let me show you, I can specify it by hand, or I can uh, use a drag and drop uh, uh, click through wizard. So let's just use the wizard. Um, and you can see, all right, so let's say I wanted to cons uh, to only ask this question if uh, the user has given consent. All right, so let's say field is relevant if all of the following conditions are true. All right, field consent is equal to the numeric value one, where one in this form is equal to yes. All right, so I hit save. Um, and I could add more conditions if I wanted. Um, and I can also then edit by hand. You can see it actually creates an expression. Um, so that if you're a more advanced user and you want to directly code the relevance, you can do that too. Uh, for the constraint, uh, it works in a similar way. Let's say I want to add a constraint. I click Add Constraint. I can click Add with a wizard. Um, and I want to create a numeric constraint. It's an income field, and I want to allow answers in the range of 0 to 10,000, say, because I think more than 10,000 would be, say, a very crazy answer. So I click Numeric. <laughs> I hit Next. Uh, and I can say minimum value uh, is 0. Maximum value is 10,000. Um, I could even allow exceptions. So let's say you know, for this question, I said, you know, enter minus 99 for don't know or minus 98 for refuse. So I can create those exceptions. Uh, if I wanted to display a custom error message, I can type that in. Uh, please enter a realistic weekly income. All right, and I hit save. Um, and, and that's it. I can then hit save now. Oh, I have to give a, a unique name to this field. All right, let's call it income. All right, and we can see we have our field created. And if you expand it, you can see it even tells you uh, the relevance visible if this expression is true. All right, and the expression for the group is true. Constrained responses only allowed if this expression is true. So you can actually see, quickly get an overview of what, when different questions will be asked, et cetera. Um, so, yeah, so that's sort of a demo of. Uh, of the of how to build constraints and relevances, and I think part two of that question was like, they wanted to explain skip patterns a bit more. So mm -hmm. skip patterns mm -hmm. in service CTO and are interchangeable with the idea of relevance. So it's sort of just flipped on its head a little bit. Where in a paper survey, the way patterns work is when you're at a question, you have an arrow saying, okay, if they've answered yes to this question, jump to question five. Whereas with service CTO and other similar tools that use digital data collection. Instead of specifying a skip pattern, you specify relevance. So you say, for question five, you say, ask this question when X, Y, Z is true. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. um, oh, all right. So and we then have, if you build, mm -hmm. oh, go ahead. No, no, sorry. Yeah, go uh, I'm, just, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna kind of uh, skip around a couple of these other questions that are related mm -hmm. to the actual interface. So the other mm -hmm. question was, if you build a survey in the drag and, uh, in the drag and drop, does this translate over the XSLM sheet like ODK uses? Mm -hmm. Can you go back and forth with this? You, you can absolutely go back and forth. So, yeah, so actually, let me see if I can. Uh, yeah, so I was hoping you wouldn't enjoy the environment, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, so we designed it with the idea that people will be able to use both interchangeably. You could start a form in the drag and drop form builder and then switch over to Excel. Maybe you're now offline, you need to be working offline, uh, you know, more easily, or you want to do, you're more comfortable in Excel. And then you can actually also have forms in Excel that you can upload into the drag and drop form builder. Um, so okay. the way to do that is say I've created this form and I could just hit export, um, which will say export to downloadable Excel file or Google Sheet. So you can actually also directly export to Google Sheet especially if you're collaborating with team members and you want everybody to be able to edit and comment on the form, then Google Sheets is mm -hmm. a good alternative. So I'm just going to, for now, since the question was about Excel, I'll, I'll export to Excel. Um, right. All right, and then it'll ask me to save the sample form. Let me just save it to my, my, my all right. All right, I'll just, I'll just save it to yeah. wherever, yeah. Um, and then you can see if I open it in Excel, um, this is what it looks like in the Excel. Um, and you can also do the reverse where you have a form in Excel that you upload into the to the drag and drop form builder. Um, and the way you would do that is you would just go to your design tab and upload form here. So you would upload the Excel file here and once it's uploaded, you can always open it by in the form builder by clicking edit. Mm -hmm. Got it. 
Great. And someone, um, another question was related to uh, the API. Could you describe how uh, a user would use this with an ME app like DHIS2? Hello? We have a REST API, oh, which lets oh, you... Oh, sorry, am I... Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. I All think right, you so accidentally went on mute for a minute. Oh, okay. Um, so, yeah, so we have three different APIs, which would let any external system, so if it's DHIS, if you have some other kind of custom IMS system, uh, which can query our server using a, the APIs and pull data in whatever format, and, you know, the, the format you desire. So the three APIs we support at the moment are, you can... Our REST API, which lets your external system, including, say, if it was DHIS, query data using an API call in CSV format. We have mm -hmm. a JSON API, which lets your external system query our data from the server using in JSON format. And we also support the standard ODK API, which is XML, the XML ODK briefcase API, which would let your external system query your server and pull data in XML format. Um, how the, the data is then mapped in your external system would be up to you because you would sort of know that best and then you can sort of pick the, one of, you know, whichever API you want to use and and have your system map the data that's pulled in to fit your mm -hmm. system. Great. Mm -hmm. And in terms of multiple languages, how do you include mm -hmm. multiple languages in a form builder? Uh, great question. So yeah, we, I mean, just uh, we, we support, you can put as many languages as you want in a form. Uh, let me show you again. So let's say, let's switch to screen share. All right. And so I'll open our form builder. Uh, so let's say if you go to, you have you have form settings. You can see there's uh, you can see you can see there's languages right now. It's only English. Uh, if I wanted to add a language, I would click Edit Form Settings, right? Um, and you can see there's languages I can hit Edit, and you can add a language here. Uh, so let's call it you know let's say I wanted to add Spanish, all right? I can hit Add, and let's say I wanted to add French, all right? Uh, and I hit OK. All right, and now I have these three languages added. I hit save, and now when I create a question, all right, um, let's say I'm just create a text question. And I hit configure. Uh, if I go to click more options, right, uh, you'll see where the label, sections open up, label section opens up. Uh, I have the label in English with the question text in English, and then now I have extra fields for entering the question text in each of the languages that I had added to that form. And you can add hints, and similarly, if you have multiple choice questions, you'll get prompts to enter the answer labels for the answer options in each language that you've added to your form. Oh, great. Um, all right. So there's this question. I'm not, I hope I'm tracking this one correctly. It's regarding updating a survey that has the mm -hmm. information with an error in the tablet for upload later. I'm not sure. Uh, does that does that question? Uh, sorry, let me sorry. Let me stop my screen share instead of if I, maybe if I read sure. the question, it'll be uh, um, possible to update a survey that has information with an error in the tablet for upload later. I'm not entirely clear on this question, so for mm -hmm. I, I'm, it's something that's making sense to you. Uh, feel um, free to interrupt no, so this seems like it's a. Questions. Uh -huh. Yeah, so it seems like it's a very specific question. Felix, I think this is your question. Um, yeah, maybe is. you can uh -huh. email me and I'm happy to answer it because I think that depends a lot on the specific error that you're getting um, and what the issue might be. Um, so, so yeah, if you can email me, I can answer a question. So you can email me at, uh, at fezan at surveycto.com uh, uh, and I'm happy to answer that, yeah. Um, Great. And you can send me the error message you're getting, yeah. I'm oh, sorry, sorry. Um, we are coming up on time, so I'm going to just close it out with one last question, mm -hmm. and that is, uh, again, another competitive advantage question, if you will, and it's around, could you compare SCTO, survey CTO, with ComCare? Why would you choose one over the other? Good question. So, I mean, I think, again, this sort of really depends on your exact preferences, right? So for different people, they want different features. I think, you know, we have different sets of features, so there's a lot of features in service CTO that aren't in ComCare. Um, I think in terms of affordability, including support, um, I think we're a much more scalable and affordable platform. So, um, you know, like I said, even with our most basic tier, you know, we include an excellent uh, support team. You know, it's always supported. You can ask all the questions you want. You don't have to pay extra to, to get, you know, same-day response or, 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 you know, emails or anything like that. Um, and, 
you know, we have our, our, our yeah, we also have our, um, and again, like I said, you know, there's also issues around security and reliability. So, you know, again, I can't always speak to say, I don't know, Comcare server infrastructure, but I do think that that if you look at our reviews and talk to other users of ours, I think everybody sort of stands by the fact that they found both services to be very flexible and powerful and easy to use, but also just very, very reliable and stable as a platform. Um, and again, I think that's one of our strengths compared to a lot of the other tools out there. But again, I encourage, you know, whoever wants to to try out all the tools they want, um, you know, we have a free trial as well. We give a lot of people trying to, to test service ETO to make their own decision. Um, and because yeah, I feel like the proof is always in the pudding. So it's, it won't be until you try it that you really know for sure which platform is best meets your needs. Thank you so much. And we really do appreciate you taking the time to join us today yeah. and, and be very uh, honest and, and clear in, in your addressing of the questions from our participants today. And I'd like to thank everybody for right. attending. For those of you who are interested in receiving a professional development hour for this session, the code is listed on the slide right now. Any additional questions, if you can't reach by on, you're also welcome to email them to uh, our webinars team. And we invite you to become a first team member and receive invitations to our upcoming webinars. Just as a reminder, for the Mobile Data Collection uh, series, we do have our next webinar with Moto Mobile on March 16th at 3 p.m. 3 p.m. Eastern Standard. Thank you everyone for attending. Have a fantastic morning, afternoon, or evening, depending where you are. And we look forward to catching you on the next C4C webinar. Bye-bye.